Chapter 10, The Return of the Lion To keep along the edge of the gorge was not so easy as it had looked. Before they had gone many yards, they were confronted with young fir woods growing at the very edge. And after they had tried to go through these, stooping and pushing for about ten minutes, they realized that, in there, it would take them an hour to do half a mile. So they came back out again and decided to go around the fir wood. This took them much further to the right than they wanted to go, far out of sight on the cliffs, out of sound of the river, till they began to be afraid that they had lost it altogether. Nobody knew the time, but it was getting to the hottest part of the day. When they were able at last to go back to the edge of the gorge, nearly a mile below the point which they had started, they found the cliffs on their side of it a good deal lower and more broken. Soon they found a way down into the gorge and continued the journey at the river's edge. But first they had a rest and a long drink. No one was talking any more about breakfast or dinner with Caspian. They may have been wise to stick to the rush instead of going along the top. It kept them sure of their direction, and ever since the fir wood they had been afraid of being forced too far off their course and losing themselves in the wood. It was an old and pathless forest, and you could not help keep anything like a straight course in it. Patches of hopeless brambles, fallen trees, boggy places, and dense undergrowth would always be getting in your way. But the Gorge of the Rush was not at all a nice place for traveling either. I mean, it was not a nice place for people in a hurry. For an afternoon's ramble ending in a picnic tea, it would have been delightful. It had everything one could want on an occasion of that sort. Rumbling waterfalls, silver cascades, deep amber-colored pools, mossy rocks, deep moss on the banks in which you could sink in over your ankles. Every kind of fern, jewel-like dragonflies, sometimes a hawk overhead, and once, Peter and Trumpkin both thought, an eagle. But of course, what the children of the dwarf wanted to see as soon as possible was the great river below them, and Baruna, and the way to Aslan's Howl. As they went on, the rush began to fall more and more steeply. Their journey became more and more of a climb and less and less of a walk. In places, even a dangerous climb over slippery rock with a nasty drop into dark chasms and the river roaring angrily at the bottom. You may be sure they watched the cliffs on their left eagerly for any sign of a break or any place they could climb them. But those cliffs remained cruel. It was maddening because everyone knew that if at once they were out of the gorge on that side, they would have only a smooth slope and a fairly short walk to Caspian's headquarters. The boys and the dwarf were now in favor of lighting a fire and cooking their bear meat. Susan didn't want this. She only wanted, as she said, to get on and finish it and get out of these beastly woods. Lucy was far too tired and miserable to have any opinion about anything. But as there was no dry wood to be had, it mattered very little what anyone thought. The boys began to wonder if raw meat was really as nasty as they had always been told. Trumpkin assured them it was. Of course, if the children had attempted a journey like this a few days ago in England, they would have been worn out. I think I've explained before how Narnia was altering them. Even Lucy was, by now, so to speak, only one-third of a little girl going to boarding school for the first time, and two-thirds Queen Lucy of Narnia. At last, said Susan. Oh, hooray, said Peter. The river gorge had just made a bend and the whole view spread out beneath them. They could see open country stretching before them to the horizon and between it and them, the broad silver ribbon, silver ribbon of the great river. They could see the especially broad and shallow place which had once been the fords of Baruna but was now spanned by a long, many-arched bridge. There was a little town at the far end of it. By Jove, said Edmund, we fought the Battle of Baruna just where that town is. Now, this cheered the boys more than anything. You can't help feeling stronger when you look at a place when you won a glorious victory, not to mention a kingdom, hundreds of years ago. Peter and, Ed and Edmund were soon so busy talking about the battle, they forgot their sore feet and the heavy drag of their male shirts on their shoulders. The dwarf was interested, too. They were all getting on at a quicker pace now. The going became easier. And though there were still sheer cliffs to the left, the ground was becoming lower on their right. Soon it was no longer a gorge at all, only a valley. There were no more waterfalls, and presently they were in a fairly thick woods again. Then, all at once, whizz, dunk, a 
sound rather like the stroke of a woodpecker. The children were still wondering where, ages ago, they'd heard a sound just like that, and they had disliked it so when Trumpkin shouted, DOWN! At the same moment, forcing Lucy, who happened to be right next to him, flat down in the bracken. Peter, who had been looking up to see if he could spot a squirrel, had seen what it was. A long, cruel arrow had sunk into a tree trunk just above his head. As he pulled Susan down and dropped himself, another came rasping over his shoulder and struck the ground at his side. Quick, 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 quick! Crawl! panted Trumpkin. They turned and wriggled along uphill under bracken amid clouds of horribly bu buzzing flies. Arrows whizzed round them. One struck Susan's helmet with a sharp ping and glanced off. They crawled quicker. Sweat poured off them. Then they ran, stooping nearly double. The boys held their swords in their hands for fear it would trip them up. It was heartbreaking work. All uphill again, back over the ground they had already traveled. When they felt they could really not run anymore, even to save their lives, they all dropped down in the damp moss beside a waterfall, behind a big boulder, panting. And they were surprised to see how far they'd already got. They listened intently, heard no sound of pursuit. So that's all right, said Trumpkin, drawing a deep breath. They're not searching the wood. Only sentries, I expect. But it means that Myraz has an outpost down there. Bottles and battle doors, though it was a near thing. I ought to have my head smacked for bringing us this way at all, said Peter. On the contrary, your majesty, said the dwarf. For one thing, it wasn't you. It was your royal brother, King Edmund, who first suggested going by Glasswater. I'm afraid the DLF is right, said Edmund, who had quite honestly forgotten this ever since things had begun going wrong. For another, continued Trumpkin. We'd gone my way. We'd have walked straight into that new outpost, most likely, or at least had just the same trouble avoiding it. I think this Glasswater route has turned out for the best. A blessing in disguise said Susan. Some disguise, said Edmund. I suppose we'll have to go right up the gorge again now, said Lucy. <sighs> Lou, you're a hero, said Peter. That's the nearest you've gotten today to saying, I told you so. Let's get on. As soon as we're well up in the forest, said Trumpkin, Whatever anyone says, I'm going to light a fire and cook supper, but we must get well away from here. There's no need to describe how they toiled back up the gorge. It was pretty hard work, but oddly enough, everyone felt more cheerful. They were getting their second wind, and the word supper had a wonderful effect. They reached the fir wood, which had caused them so much trouble while it was still daylight, and bivouacked in a hollow just above it. It was tedious gathering the firewood, but it was grand when the fire blazed up and they began producing the damp and smeary parcels of bear meat, which would have been so unattractive to anyone who had not spent the day outdoors. The dwarf had splendid ideas about cookery. Each apple, and they still had a few of these, was wrapped up in the bear's meat, as if it were to be an apple dumpling with meat inside of pastry, only much thicker, and spiked on a sharp stick, and then roasted and the juice of the apple worked all the way through the meat, like applesauce with roast pork. Bear that has lived too much on other animals is not very nice, but bear that has gotten plenty of honey and fruit is excellent, and this turned out to be that sort of bear. It was a truly glorious meal. And of course, no washing up, only lying back and watching the smoke from Trumpkin's pipe and stretching one's tired legs and chatting. Everyone felt quite hopeful now about finding King Caspian tomorrow and defeating Myraz in a few days. It may not have been sensible of them to feel like this, but they did. They dropped off to sleep, one by one, but all pretty quickly. Lucy woke out of the deepest sleep you can imagine, with the feeling that the voice she liked best in the world had been calling her name. She thought at first it was her father's voice, but that did not seem quite right. Then she thought it was Peter's voice, but that did not seem to fit either. She did not want to get up, not because she was still tired. On the contrary, she was wonderfully rested and all the aches had gone from her bones, but because she felt so extremely happy 
uncomfortable. She was looking straight up at the Narnian moon, which is larger than ours, and at the starry sky for the place where they had bivouacked was comparatively open. Lucy, came the voice again, neither her father's voice nor Peter's. She sat up, trembling with excitement, but not with fear. The moon was so bright, the whole forest landscape around her was almost clear as day, though it looked wilder. Behind her was the fir wood, away to her right the jagged cliff tops on the far side of the gorge, straight ahead, open grass to where a glade of trees began about a bow shot away. Lucy looked very hard at the trees of that glade. Why, I do believe they're moving, she said to herself. They're walking about. She got up her heart beating wildly, and walked toward them. There was certainly a noise in the glade, a noise such as trees make in high wind, though there was no wind in, t in sight. Yet it was not exactly an ordinary tree noise either. Lucy felt there was a tune in it, but she could not catch the tune any more than she had been able to catch the words when the trees had so nearly talked to her the night before. But there was at least a lilt. She felt her own feet wanting to dance as she got near. And now there was no doubt that the trees were really moving, moving in and out through one another as if in a complicated country dance. I suppose, thought Lucy, when trees dance, it must be a very, very country dance indeed. She was almost among them now. The first tree she looked at seemed at first glance to not be a tree at all, but a huge man with a shaggy beard and great bushes of hair. She was not frightened, she had seen such things before, but when she looked again, he was only a tree, though he was still moving. You couldn't see whether he had feet or roots, of course, because when trees move, they don't walk on the surface of the earth, they wade in it as we do in water. The same thing happened with every tree she looked at. At one moment, there seemed to be the friendly, lovely giant and giantess forms which tree people put on when some good magic has called them into full life. Next moment, they all looked like trees again. But when they looked like trees, it was like strangely human trees. And when they looked like people, it was like strangely branchy and leafy people. And all the time, that queer, lilting, rustling, cool, merry noise. They are almost awake. Not quite, said Lucy. She knew herself was wide awake, wide, wider than anyone usually is. She went fearlessly in among them, dancing herself as she leaped this way and that to avoid being run into by these huge partners. But she was only half interested in them. She wanted to get beyond them to something else. It was from beyond them that the dear voice had called. She soon got through them, half wondering whether she had been using her arms to push branches aside or to take hands in a great chain with big dancers who stooped to reach her. For there were really a, tr a ring of trees around a central open place. She stepped out from among their shifting confusion of lovely lights and shadows. A circle of grass, smooth as a lawn, met her eyes with dark trees dancing all around it, and then, oh, joy, for he was there. The huge lion, shining white in the moonlight, with his huge black shadow underneath him. But for the moment of his tail, he might have been a stone lion, but Lucy never thought that. She never stopped to think whether he was a friendly lion or not. She rushed to him. She felt her heart would burst if she lost a moment. And the next thing she knew was that she was kissing him and putting her arms as far around his neck as she could and burying her face in the beautiful, rich silkiness of his mane. Aslan, Aslan, oh dear, Aslan, sobbed Lucy. At last, the great beast rolled over on his side so that Lucy fell half sitting and half lying between his front paws. He bent forward and just touched her nose with his tongue. His warm breath came all around her. She gazed up into the large, wise face. Welcome, child, he said. Aslan, said Lucy, you're bigger. That is because you are older, little one, answered he. Not because you are? I am not. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. 
For a time she was so happy that she did not want to speak. But Aslan spoke. Lucy, he said, we must not lie here for long. You have work in hand, and much time was lost today. <sighs> yes, wasn't it a shame, said Lucy. I saw you all right. They wouldn't believe me. They're all so... From somewhere deep inside Aslan's body, there came the faintest suggestion of a growl. Uh, I'm sorry, said Lucy, who understood some of his moods. I didn't mean to start slinging the others, but it wasn't my fault anyway, was it? The lion looked straight into her eyes. Oh, Aslan, said Lucy, you don't mean it was. How could I? I couldn't have left the others and come to you alone. How could I? Oh, don't look at me like that. Well, I... I mean, I suppose I... I could. Yes. And it wouldn't have been alone. I know. Not if I was with you. But what would have been the good? Aslan said nothing. You mean said Lucy rather faintly, that it would have turned out all right somehow. But how? Please, Aslan, am I, am I not to know? To know what would have happened, child, said Aslan. No. Nobody is ever told that. Oh, dear, said Lucy. But anyone can find out what will happen, said Aslan. If you go back to the others now and wake them up and tell them you have seen me again and that you must all get up at once and follow me, what will happen? There is only one way to find out. Do you mean that is what you want me to do? gasped Lucy. Yes, little one, said Aslan. Will the others see you too? asked Lucy. Certainly not at first, said Aslan. Later on, it depends. But they won't believe me, said Lucy. It doesn't matter, said Aslan. Oh dear, oh dear, said Lucy. And I was so pleased at finding you again. And I thought you'd let me stay. And I, I thought you'd come roaring in and frighten all the enemies away like last time, and now everything is going to be horrid. It is hard for you, little one, said Aslan. But things never happen the same way twice. It has been hard for all of us in Narnia before now. Lucy buried her head in his mane to hide from his face. But there must have been some magic in his mane. She could feel lion strength growing into her. Quite suddenly, she sat up. I'm sorry, Aslan, she said. I'm ready now. Now you are a lioness, said Aslan. And now all Narnia will be renewed. But come, we have no time to lose. He got up and walked with stately, noiseless paces back to the belt of dancing trees through which she had just come. And Lucy went with him, laying a rather tremulous hand on his mane. The trees parted to let them through, and for one second assumed their human forms completely. Lucy had a glimpse of tall and lovely wood gods and wood goddesses all bowing to the lion. Next moment, there were trees again, but still bowing with such graceful sweeps of branch and trunk that their bowing was itself a kind of dance. Now, child, said Aslan, when they had left all the trees behind them, I will wait here. Go and wake the others. Tell them to follow. If they will not, then you, at least, must follow me alone. It is a terrible thing to have to wake up four people, all older than yourself and all very tired, for the purposes of telling them something they probably won't believe and making them do something they certainly won't like. I mustn't think about it. I must just do it, thought Lucy. She went to Peter first and shook him. Peter, she whispered in her ear. 
Wake up, quick! Aslan is here! He says we've got to follow him at once! Certainly, Lou, what, whatever you'd like, said Peter unexpectedly. Well, this was encouraging. But, as Peter instantly rolled around and went to sleep again, it wasn't much use. Then she tried Susan. Susan did really wake up, but only to say in her most annoying grown-up voice, You've been dreaming, Lucy. Go to sleep again. She tackled Edmund next. It was very difficult to wake him, but when at last she had done it, he was really awake, and he sat up. Ah! Huh? He said in a grumpy voice. What, what, what are you talking about? She said it all over again. This was one of the worst parts of her job, for each time she said it, it sounded less convincing. Aslan, said Edmund, jumping up. Hooray! Where? Lucy turned back to where she could see the line waiting, his patient eyes fixed upon her. There, she said, pointing. Where? asked Edmund again. There. There, don't you see? Just the side of the trees. Edmund stared hard for a while and then said, no, there's, there's nothing there. You've got dazzled and muddled with the moonlight. One does, you know. I, I thought I saw something for a moment myself, but it's only a, uh, an optical, what do you call it? I can see him all the time, said Lucy. He's looking straight at us. Well, then why can't I see him? He said you mightn't be able to. Why? I don't know. That's just what he said. <sighs> oh, bother it all, said Edmund. I do wish you wouldn't keep on seeing things. But I suppose we'll have to wake the others. And that's the end of chapter 10. So Aslan has indeed returned. And even the forest, the woods, and the trees seem to be waking up because of him. But only Lucy so far can see him. And it's going to be her job to do what she failed to do the day before. Convince the others to have a little faith. Faith in Aslan. Faith in her. And to follow. It didn't work out so well last time, but I think maybe in retrospect, she gave up a little too soon. Maybe with Edmund's help, they'll be able to do it right this time. But I think the very best passage in this whole almost dreamlike chapter was that one right in the middle where she first meets Aslan and realizes something. Aslan, said Lucy, you are bigger. That is because you are older, little one. Not because you are. I am not. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. And every year we grow with the Lord, we will find him bigger. As small children, our concepts of God and of our Savior may feel very, very big. But as we get older, as life seems to feel a little more complicated, complex, the way we are looking at the world seems to be more mature. God never stays the same size that he was when we were small, but he grows in our minds right along with our lives and the troubles of this world. If we will walk with him, we won't find him smaller as we get older, simpler or less important. Instead, as we follow more, we will know more. And when we know more, we will see more. And when we see more, we will love more. The bigness and greatness of God will be even bigger than we can comprehend or imagine. But the older and more mature we are, we'll just keep discovering more and more. But there's always more still to come.